Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you on the online event of the Biodiversity Hunting Countryside Intergroup. And today we are going to discuss the delivery of the nature restoration law for rural stakeholders and biodiversity. This is an online session with English and German interpretation. And the session is hosted by the member of the European Parliament, Alvaro Amaro, who is also the chair of the intergroup. This meeting is organized in conjunction with the European Landowners Organization and with FAS, the European Federation for Hunting and Conservation. My name is uh, Jürgen Tuck. I'm a scientific uh, director for the European Landowners Organization, and I'm uh, broadcasting from the headquarters here in the shadows of the Berlemont building. I would like to welcome all of our speakers, that's including the members of the European Parliament participating, but also the other speakers and the other participants to the meeting. Uh, as said, there is German translation available for those who would like to make use of it. If you would like to make use of it, you will see that uh, at the lower level of your screen, you have a number of buttons and one of that is a small globe with the text interpretation. There you can make a choice whether you would like to follow this in English or in German, or let's say in the original languages. That are the three options you get over there. I would like to ask all of our speakers to respect a number of rules so that we make sure that this webinar is running smoothly. Uh, I would like to ask all of you to stay muted during the meeting and only to push on the speak button when we give you the floor. Please keep your camera on unless it affects the quality of your internet. And I will do exactly the opposite. I will switch it off. But if you see that I switch it on again, that makes that your time is up and that you should round up more or less. If you are not doing that or within the minutes, then I will interfere, but I will use my microphone. Um, if you want to add something to the discussion, you can always make use of the raise hand button. And we, I'm asking also the, the attendees to send their questions via the chat online. So that is, that is valid for all of uh, the people listening and, and, and looking at this webinar. If you would like to send questions to one of our, uh, of our speakers, please make use of the chat function. Okay, the intergroup biodiversity hunting and countryside plays an extremely important role to raise the voice of various stakeholders who are directly involve, uh, involved in the dynamics of rural areas. That's agricultural practices and biodiversity conservation. This meeting specifically aims at discussing the opportunities and challenges for the ambitious European Commission's proposal on binding restoration targets. And we will have members of the European Parliament, European Commission officials and relevant stakeholders who today will provide their views on the proposal, which is one of the key tools shaped by the European Commission to tackle the present biodiversity crisis. As we have a very full agenda for this online meeting, we have tried to organize it as interactive as possible. I will try to keep it as interactive as possible. And for that, I would like to ask everybody to keep within the time limits foreseen. But first of all, I would like to invite Mr. Amaro as chairman of the intergroup to officially open today's event. Mr. Amaro, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, uh, dear participants, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this intergroup webinar on the restoration law. Allow me also a special word to our uh, panelists, which accepted our invitation uh, to be here today. As you know, restoration is uh, an integral part of the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. This is why the European Commission presented its proposal on uh, bending restoration targets, the so-called restoration law last June. I believe it is important uh, for MAPS and the civil society to discuss this proposal. 
particularly to understand how it works and how relevant stakeholders will be involved. As you know, the European Parliament will be engaging on this file too. And this is why these events involving civil society representatives and the European lawmakers are so important. I am glad to see we have several distinguished speakers, beginning with my colleagues and finishing with some extraordinary experts. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, and some extraordinary experts, which will tackle the proposal from different perspectives. As As you should know, I will conclude the events and I will leave my ideas about this law after listening to all of you. And to conclude my initial remarks, I give the floor again to our moderator, Jürgen Tech, ELO Scientific Director. The floor is yours, Jürgen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as we said in the beginning, we have a combination of members of the European Parliament, stakeholders, uh, and people of the European Commission. But I would like to start with three opening speeches coming from three different members of the European Parliament. We have one in person, even if this is a digital meeting, uh, and we have two who have sent us a video message. So I would like to start with the member of the European Parliament for joining us uh, physically, and that is Mrs. Maria Norkel. She is from the Agri Committee, and I would like to give you the floor, please. Ganz herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Ich werde die Übersetzung nutzen und Deutsch sprechen. Ich glaube, es ist uns allen klar, dass die Wissenschaft und wir alle sind uns einig, dass wir nur noch ein kurzes Zeitfenster haben, ein Zeitfenster haben, um überhaupt diese ganzen bedrohten Arten sicherzustellen. Der Verlust der biologischen Vielfalt und die Verschlechterung der Ökosysteme schreitet in einem alarmierenden Tempo voran. Immer wieder liegt klar auf dem Tisch, 81 Prozent der Lebensräume sind in einem schlechten Zustand. Nur 14 Prozent der Lebensräume in der EU befinden sich in einem guten Zustand. Nur 14 Prozent. Ein Drittel aller Bienen- und Schmetterlingsarten sind am Rückgang. Bisher hat die EU versagt. Man muss es ganz klar sagen, wir haben es nicht geschafft, auf den bisherigen Wegen den Verlust der Bio, äh, biologischen Vielfalt zu stoppen, aufzuhalten. Wir haben es nicht geschafft, denn bisher war es auch so, dass es ausschließlich freiwillige Maßnahmen gab. Diese freiwilligen Verpflichtungen in der EU waren meiner Meinung nach ein Fehler. Wir brauchen einen ehrgeizigen, umfassende Strategie und wir brauchen vor allen Dingen rechtsverbindliche Zielsetzungen. Ich freue mich, dass die Kommission jetzt diese Forderungen auch so sieht und dass das Gesetz zur Wiederherstellung der Natur vorgelegt wurde. In meinen Augen ist der Gesetzesvorschlag eine große Chance, eine große Chance für uns alle. Die Wiederherstellung von Ökosystemen wie Mooren und Wälder auf der einen Seite, natürlich aber auch die CO2-Bindung, die Wiederherstellung der, der Natur, ähm, äh, ist die beste Versicherungspolice äh, für die Klimaanpassung. Das muss uns klar sein. Folglich ist auch die Wiederherstellung der Natur langfristig unsere Ernährungssicherung. Wir müssen sicherstellen, dass alle Schlupflöcher geschlossen werden, dass wir Ambitionen haben, dass wir wirklich ambitioniert vorgehen und dass wir alle Chancen nutzen. Ich möchte noch kurz drei Punkte in den Mittelpunkt stellen, drei Artikel, die ganz besonders schwierig sind. Artikel Nummer 8 sieht vor, dass die Mitgliedstaaten sicherstellen sollen, dass der abnehmende Trend von Bestäuberpopulationen bis 2030 umgekehrt wird. Und da wird dann von einem befriedigenden Stand gesprochen. Und das ist natürlich ganz, ganz schwierig, denn was ist denn ein befriedigender Erhaltungszustand? Hier ist es zu schwammig, die Bezeichnung. Artikel 9. Artikel 9 sieht vor, dass die landwirtschaftlichen Ökosysteme wiederhergestellt werden. Und auch hier ist es so, dass man ganz klar eine Kritik äh, deutlich machen muss, dass es keine quantifizierten, zeitlich begrenzten Ziele gibt, dass die nicht definiert wurden. Auch das bleibt also schwammig für uns zu wenig klar. 
für die Landwirtschaft, und das ist mir ganz, ganz wichtig, es hier zu betonen, für die Land Landwirtschaft wird es auf der einen Seite bedeuten, weniger Pestizide einzusetzen und mehr Flächen für die Natur zur Verfügung zu stellen. Das darf aber auf keinen Fall bedeuten, dass das ohne Gegenleistung passiert. Landwirte müssten daran verdienen können, nämlich Honorierung von diesen öffentlichen Ausgaben. Das ist mir besonders wichtig. Ganz umstritten ist auch der Artikel 9, dort geht es um die ähm, Moore. So sollen ähm, 70 Prozent der Moore bis 2050 ähm, wiederhergestellt werden und die Hälfte davon wieder vernässt werden. Das ist wirklich auch ein Verlust an landwirtschaftlicher Fläche. Das können wir nur gemeinschaftlich tragen. Und als letzter Punkt der Artikel 10, die Wiederherstellung von Öko, Waldökosystemen, auch wieder hier taucht der Begriff zufriedenstellender Zustand auf. Aber es gibt keine quantifizierten, keine zeitlich begrenzten Ziele. Sie wurden nicht definiert. Ähm, es ist zu wenig deutlich, wie viel stehendes, liegendes Totholz, wie viel Anteil an Wäldern mit ungleicher Altersstruktur und so weiter wir brauchen. Für mich abschließend, es sind sehr gute Gedanken auf dem Tisch. Es fehlt noch das wirkliche Knackige, dass wir Dinge uns zeitlich, dass wir Dinge zeitlich einordnen müssen. Und ein Punkt ist mir ganz wichtig zum Schluss. All das kann nur gemeinsam vor Ort gehen. Nicht über die Köpfe der Landbesitzer hinweg, sondern mit den Landbesitzern gemeinschaftlich ehrgeizige Ziele verwirklichen. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Danke für die Einladung. Und ich glaube, es ist deutlich geworden, dass der Artikel 8, 9 und 10 für mich ganz besonders im Fokus steht. Herzlichen Dank. Herzlichen Dank. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Neuchel, also for being here live uh, at the webinar. Now, uh, we have two other members of the European Parliament who, want, who wanted uh, to comment. Uh, that's uh, Christine Schneider. She's a member of the Envy Committee. And that is uh, Alexander Vondra, who is also uh, an Envy Committee member. Both of them have uh, made a, a video message for us. And uh, we will show that right now. Der Schutz der Biodiversität und auch die Reduzierung von Pflanzenschutzmitteln, sie sind Kernanliegen von uns allen. Für diese Ziele setze ich mich auch ganz persönlich ein, denn Biodiversität, sie geht uns alle an. Artenvielfalt ist nötig für jede Form von Leben und eine gesunde Biodiversität ist entscheidend für die Zukunft der Menschen, aber auch für die Land- und Forstwirtschaft. Ohne Artenvielfalt haben wir alle ein Problem. Der Vorschlag der Europäischen Kommission, Pflanzenschutzmittel in Schutzgebieten zu verbieten, schießt allerdings extrem über das Ziel hinaus und ist an vielen Stellen zu einseitig gegen die Landwirtschaft gerichtet und vernachlässigt den Aspekt der Ernährungssicherheit. Ich werde daher fordern, dass der Vorschlag der Kommission so nicht umgesetzt wird. Der Vorschlag baut zudem auf der falschen Annahme auf, dass nur auf stillgelegten Flächen mehr Biodiversität entstehen kann. Diese Annahme wurde jedoch bereits von mehreren Studien widerlegt. Es ergeben sich außerdem noch ganz viele Fragen zur Abgrenzung der Schutzgebiete und auf die Auswirkungen auf die Landnutzung. Für mich als zuständige Berichterstatterin meiner Fraktion für den Bericht zur Wiederherstellung der Natur ist ein ganzheitlicher Ansatz wichtig. In den Verhandlungen werde ich dafür kämpfen, dass es kein generelles Verbot von Pflanzenschutzmitteln in land- und forstwirtschaftlich genutzten Flächen geben wird. Und stattdessen werde ich mich für eine nachhaltige Bewirtschaftung einsetzen, die sich auf die drei Säulen der Nachhaltigkeit – Ökonomie, Ökologie und Soziales – stützt. Hier sollten insbesondere die Chancen der Pflanzenschutzmittelreduktion durch die neuen Züchtungstechnologien sowie Digital Farming gefördert werden. Thank you for inviting me to the biodiversity hunting countryside intergroup debate on the nature due to time constraints. 
I am unable to attend, so I will speak uh, to you briefly at least this way. As you will know, I am one of the rebels in our conservative group when it comes to biodiversity. I try to be as supportive as possible of some moves to develop it, especially where it makes the most sense in terms of the potential to reduce CO2 emissions or to protect nature as a whole. I therefore awaited the Commission's proposal with some anticipation. I have to say, however, that I was still somewhat disappointed. Here are the reasons. Firstly, in its proposal, the Commission comes up with the ambitious EU-wide targets, but it will be up to the Member States to implement them. And there is not only the risk of administrative burden, but above all, the risk that the burden of meeting the EU targets will not be shared fairly. Secondly, we must logically ask where we will get the money for all the proposed measures. At a time when dramatically rising energy prices and inflation are having a significant impact in our societies, this question is more relevant than ever. And thirdly, the proposal fails to take into account the fact that we are at the war, that we also need to ensure food security at the moment. In other words, at least in the short term, we need to moderate the demands for nature restoration. The legislative process is just beginning and I would be definitely welcome your inputs. The more specific they are, the better. The aim will be nothing less than to ensure that the resulting legislation promotes biodiversity but does not ultimately go directly, directly against the citizens and the nature itself. I believe it is you, the members of the Biodiversity Hunting and Countryside Intergroup, who understand this better than anybody else. Thank you for your attention. Well, I think that there are three very clear messages we got from three different members of the European Parliament, each sharing their own vision. <clears throat> now, before we start discussing a number of issues they also uh, mentioned, I think we need, first of all, a basis of good knowledge to start our discussion. And it is an absolute pleasure to have uh, Stefan Leiner from the European Commission. He's the head of Natural Capital and Ecosystem Health Unit. And uh, we had a discussion last week on which we said, okay, absolutely necessary to start a discussion is to have a correct scientific basis to start that discussion. Uh, I think we need two elements. Uh, we need a good view on what the, Com the European Commission wants to realize uh, with this nature restoration law. Secondly, I think we need, uh, let's say, the insights from the scientific community. We will have this afternoon the opportunity to have both, but the first one I would like to give the floor is Stefan Leiner for the European Commission. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jürgen, and uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Hello, dear honorable members and participants to this uh, very timely uh, meeting. Um, I hope that the connection will be stable enough and that you hear me well because unfortunately the uh, corporate computer did not allow me to enter this meeting. So I had to use my iPad and I'm using wireless and already here and there in the previous uh, remarks, my sound went away. So I hope it will work well. Um, first of all, I want to, to reiterate that uh, we really believe that this uh, commission proposal is pioneering. It's the first in its kind and likely to become a most impactful piece of nature legislation in the last 30 years. It has been more than 30 years that we had the last time a law on nature in the EU. Um, it's a key deliverable of the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, uh, which is in itself a key deliverable of the European Green Deal. And it also responds to a request from the European Parliament itself 
which in its resolution of 9 June 2021 on the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, strongly welcomed uh, that uh, the commitment of the Commission to draw up a legislative proposal on the EU nature restoration plan, including on binding restoration targets. So we are really responding to a request of the European Parliament here. Now, uh, it was already said by Maria Neuchel, um, we, our ecosystems are not in a good health. So I will not repeat uh, what she has said uh, on those numbers. But I would say that the scientific evidence, including the last report from, for example, the IPCC, is very clear. The biggest threat to food production and food security, and that also responds to a remark from MEP Alexander Vondra, the biggest threats to food production and food security are climate change and biodiversity loss. By restoring healthy and biodiverse ecosystems, the law will help ensure the sustainable economic activity of those who directly depend on such healthy ecosystems for their livelihoods, the farmers, the foresters, the fishermen, and many others. Restoring nature is essential to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity, to increase the resilience of ecosystems to the impacts of climate change. And I think those of us who have witnessed the past years with the extreme droughts and before that the extreme floodings, we have seen how much it is important that we have healthy nature that allows us to adapt to those unfortunately unavoidable impacts of climate change that will happen. Uh, and also in the urban areas, these restored ecosystems, urban greening, helps us to keep our cities cool and to help us adapt to uh, extreme events uh, and also are important for our mental health. So uh, biodiverse and sustainably managed agricultural ecosystems, they will be more resilient to climate change and restoring agricultural ecosystem will also foster independence from chemical pesticides and fertilizers imports from Russia and Belarus. Again, uh, it is not because we are in a war that we need to do more on restoring nature in becoming less dependent on those uh, entrants that we are having. I want to stress that the proposal is not about stopping production. It is about restoring nature while ensuring an income to those who work on the land. So uh, the link to this, I think what uh, MEP Schneider mentioned was more a comment to another proposal that was uh, tabled by the commission on the same day on the sustainable use of pesticides, which aims to make the uh, farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy objectives of reducing the risk and use and of pesticides by 50% legally binding. But the nature restoration law is not about that. That is a different piece of legislation where our colleagues, our DG Sante, are taking the lead. So I will not go into, into that uh, details on this. Um, so um, what we are proposing in the nature restoration law is first of all an overarching objective coupled with then some binding targets for specific ecosystems to ensure a broad coverage of ecosystems to be restored uh, resilient and adequately protected the overarching target is really to put in place on at least 20 percent of our land and see uh, measures, restoration measures by 2030, and then in the longer term that all areas that need to be restored, there are restoration measures there in line with the EU biodiversity strategy that the Parliament also welcomed, which is to put Europe back on the path to recovery by 2030, and then by 2050 we really have recovered all of our degraded ecosystems. So we have some very concrete targets that will help implementing existing legislation. You know that the Birds and Habitats Directive, they have already the obligation to establish a favorable conservation status for many habitats and species. And part of that is also the obligation to have good condition, but there are no times, there are no deadlines. So we introduce with this law, a concrete obligation for the member states to do a certain part of that areas to be restored uh, by a certain date. And that is very important because we are not adding a new obligation, we just say that the current trend where we actually go in the reverse uh, trend when it comes to the status of those species has to be reversed and we want concrete improvement by a concrete time. 
uh, and we think that will really add value to existing uh, legislation, both when it comes to the terrestrial and the marine habitats. So um, we have also some very concrete targets. I will not uh, elaborate them more in details on uh, urban habitats, on restoring free flowing rivers, on pollinator populations, on certain agricultural uh, features like farmland birds, on, on peatlands. Uh, by the way, on peatlands also responding to a comment that was made, we should not forget that peatlands that are under agricultural use are only covering 3% of the total utilized agricultural area. But they are responsible for 25% of the total emissions from agriculture. So if we want to see a low hanging fruit of combining nature restoration, investing in nature-based solutions to achieve also our objective to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050, this is really something we need to embark on. And we are very much convinced that it will not affect our food security because it will cover quite a small part of our land. And there is enough of possibility of continuing grazing or other types of, uh, of uh, agriculture on those areas. Uh, a core element of the proposal is to develop that the member states develop a national restoration plan which should detail the areas to be restored, the plant restoration measures, the inventory of those barriers where uh, that need to be removed in order to have free flowing rivers, uh, but also the intended means of financing and the expected benefits and co-benefits also, it's especially in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigation. And uh, those plans should be coordinated with the existing plan, like for example, the climate and energy plans, but also uh, the so-called go-to areas that are designated to speed up the uh, deployment of renewable energy. So also here, deployment of renewable energy, nature restoration can go hand in hand if it's planned wisely. Um, these plans should be done in a science-based, open and inclusive process. And that is very important that the public, including the land users, are being allowed to early and effectively participate in the elaboration of the plans. And here I really much agree with what some MEPs have said that without the farmers, the forest owners, the people on the ground and having them on board, we will not have restoration happening. It's as simple as that. So it's very important that member states uh, design a system that creates the right incentives that brings those local people on board. And that also means, for example, when they are at the moment developing their CAP strategic plans or their operational programs, they really take those opportunities that the EU budget is offering in order to, to invest in nature restoration. Our impact assessment has clearly demonstrated that in each euro invested in nature restoration has at least eight euro of benefits. Um, and we should not forget that there is an agreement between the Parliament, the Council and the Commission that uh, from 2026 on at least 10% of the EU budget should be dedicated to biodiversity. They will need also national funding, they will need also private funding, and I think the carbon farming and other aspects are very important developments here, but the EU is ready to support member states in making sure that there is adequate funding available through those 10% of the MFF that will be available. Uh, I will close by also making a link to the global context. Uh, let's not forget that we have a very important international meeting coming up in Montreal in December this year, the 15th conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And I think with this proposal, we show that the EU takes the global objectives of halting and reversing biodiversity loss very seriously. Uh, by the way, there is also a UN decade on uh, ecosystem restoration that was put in place last year by the UN General Assembly. Again, that's very important in that context. So um, since we have made the proposal of the law, we have received already a lot of positive comments. I think there were a lot of stakeholders, member states, MEPs who have welcomed that finally our proposal was put on the table. And I think there is a general agreement 
that we need to do more to restoring nature. But obviously, there is a lot of clarifications that need to be done. There is a lot of questions about some elements of it. And we very much look forward to work with all to further make sure that, first of all, we maintain a high level of ambition in the sense of urgency. So we don't take too much time in finding a common agreement between the Council and the Parliament uh, when it comes to the final adoption of our proposal. Um, so that we really can have a final adoption in a reasonable time. Uh, we look very much forward to work with the Council and the Parliament and other stakeholders, and uh, we very much appreciate the constructive inputs the Commission has received in the pro process towards developing the proposal, and we look forward for that continued same constructive basis for the uh, months to come uh, when we discuss now the Commission proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I hope that you have the time to join us for the discussion afterwards. Yes. Now, that's great. But uh, but even then, uh, let's say I saw in the chat a question which I think is relevant uh, to ask you immediately as, as it is not a discussion point, but a clarification. And that question is coming from Alexei Lotman. And he's speaking about, uh, well, first of all, it's very positive about the nature restoration now, but then he says, okay, in Article 9 has a requirement not to graze the landscape elements, uh, while he sees a lot of, of benefits for grazing. So I, I will read out uh, what he exactly is writing. But the devil is in the details. Annex 4, the one referred to in the set Article 9, has a requirement not to graze the landscape elements for indicator share of agricultural land with high diversity landscape features. The descri description includes they cannot be under productive agricultural use, including grazing or fodder production. Uh, so the question here, uh, is he reading the text in the right way? And is there a problem with grazing? Because grazing is, let's say, a measurement technique also used in nature conservation. Yes, uh, he is right. Um, and one should remember what are landscape elements. Landscape elements are important features, like, for example, hedges or stone walls, or tree lines or, uh, or ponds uh, that we have lost uh, in big time uh, through many places in Europe. And um, they have actually had, this loss had a negative impact on the agriculture itself and on the agricultural productivity because it has uh, fueled erosion. It has fueled the decline of pollinators. And those pollinators, you know, are so essential by providing the pollinators pollination service, I think over 75% of our vegetables and crops depend on pollination. So it is for the sake of not only biodiversity, but also for agriculture that it is very important that we start re-establishing those landscape features. But if you start incorporating in those landscape features, for example, all the grasslands, then these are not features that do that, uh, that, that have that provision anymore. I think restoring grasslands is indeed very important and we need grazing also for restoring a lot of the ecosystems that we are talking about. But here we really talk about this very specific uh, features which are clear landscape features in order to establish more uh, structure in our landscape and more connectivity between various uh, areas. Okay, thank you for that. I think that's a very clear clarification, which is already solving a first question uh, coming out of the audience. Um, for the next uh, 40 minutes, I would say, we have uh, four uh, specialist speakers uh, and they will give us the opportunity to give, give us a variety of point of views on the nature restoration now. And uh, we will go from, uh, let's say, from, from member state expertise to university professors. We will go from the green NGOs to the landowners. Uh, all of them have a place in this discussion and they will be able to share their thoughts with, with us. The first speaker we have foreseen is Dr. He Heidi Kruger. She's from the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Finland. And she's currently the project manager for the SOTCA project that aims to revert the decline of waterfall. She has a background in wildlife research with a special interest in game birds and invasive alien uh, predators. And she's also an active hunter, but with a passion for game, game management. Uh, Mrs. Kruger, I would like to give you the floor. 
please. Thank you very much, and I hope you hear me well. Um, I would like to thank, thank for the opportunity to be able to present my, my project here uh, at this intergroup. And um, my project, like you told, uh, aims to revert the declining trend in waterfowl populations. And uh, we uh, do this by bringing together landowners, conservation workers, and hunters. So next slide. Um, a little bit background here first. So many waterfowl populations are currently in decline. And the main reason behind this decline is considered to be habitat deterioration, which is caused by eutrophication, which causes overgrowth of wetlands, along with the continued spread of invasive alien predators. And in Finland, these species are the American mink and the raccoon dog. So definitely some restoration actions are needed. Next slide. So my SOTCA project is part of uh, the HELMI program, which is an umbrella program, um, a joint program of the two ministries, Ministry of the Environment and Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Finland. And the aim of this program is to halt biodiversity loss until 2030. Uh, HELMI program works on five target habitats uh, on peatlands, wetlands, forests, aquatic and shore habitats, and semi-natural grasslands. Uh, I've included here the link which you can go to and look more closely to the HELMI program. Next. The wetland targets for 2030 in the HELMI program are these as follows. Uh, there's a uh, restoration of 200 important wetland areas. These are all natural 2000 uh, special protection areas, as well as the continuous management of these 100 restored important wetlands. Uh, this is all done by governmental organizations because these are really large areas and it requires a lot of uh, expertise as well as a lot of um, financing. And this is uh, a good example of it, that uh, protection as itself is not enough. We need some management on these areas if you want to have the biodiversity value, especially for the wetland birds. Uh, then we also have invasive alien species control on 70 of these restored Natura 2000 wetlands. And we have restoration and construction of 500 new wetlands outside protected areas. And we also want to create a network of 150 resting areas for migrating water birds. And these, which are on red, are also the areas where the SOTCA project is working currently at. Next. So SOTCA project uh, has started in 2020 and will continue until 24. We have 9 million euros to spend and we want to engage landowners and hunters to do this restoration work. And first, I present the Sotka Wetlands Project, which is run by the Finnish Wildlife Agency. And we are there looking for, for areas from private landowners. We are funding calls and um, the, the landowners offer areas. And there's a selection process that will then pick those areas which are the most cost efficient, but also the most biodiversity efficient areas. And in this case, the biodiversity that we are looking for is good breeding areas for, for ducks. Um, here we have uh, um, the, all the private landowners, they have to have their own financing, about 50%, depending on the target. Uh, but this financing can also be done through own work. We have collaboration with hunters and research. We have mandatory predator control on all, all areas. And we have also yearly bird count so that we can have a follow up on the biodiversity that we are creating there. So far, we have 40 areas established. Uh, the mean size is 12 hectares. Next. SOTCA project also wants to engage the cooperation between stakeholders. Uh, we have a SOTCA resting area project that is run by the Finnish Hunters Association and BirdLife Finland jointly together. They are, this is a consulting and negotiation project. They are arranging webinars and face-to-face -face meetings with private landowners and hunters 
and they are trying to reach voluntary agreements of non-hunting areas for the migration time. So this means areas where the wetland birds can prepare for the migration and um, molt their feathers in, 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 without being disturbed. So far, we have 20 areas established. Next. And then um, in this project, um, we have clearly understood that um, restoration without predator control can be a big waste of money. There's no idea in no point in creating good habitats if you are not controlling the predators that will then destroy all the breeding ducks and, 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 and their nests. So um, we have already reached the target of 70, um, 70 area areas of these this, this 17 natural 2000 areas. We are now currently working on 73 areas. We have a project called Helmi Predator Control. We have a predator control on these natural areas and a few kilometers buffer areas around these, these areas where we control the predators so that we get the most effective predator control. And we, the, here we have as the operators, the Finnish Wildlife Agency, as well as the Finnish Metsähallitus or the Forest and Park Services. We have their 10 co uh, coordinators working who are working with 420 voluntary hunters who are local, local hunters from these areas. And, and it's a really huge project. And we also have a project called Summer Cottage Owners to Eradicate Invasive Alien Predators in Finland by the Finnish Hunters Association and their volunteers. Uh, you can read more about that project in the on, in, on FACE Biodiversity Manifesto pages. It was, I think, a project of last December. And then we also work in the archipelago. And th from there, we have been working already before Sotka project also. So from there, we have very good um, also scientific results that this really works. And we are really able to do, do to have some impact on the biodiversity and on the breeding results of the birds. In this project, we have a collaboration with landowners and local hunters and hunting clubs. This cannot be done from upwards. This has to be done on the local level. We need to local people and their engagement here. Costs in this project are, of course, the coordinator salaries, but then we have the traps and wildlife cameras, some travel costs and also one-time payments for the hunters who are involved in this one. I need to say uh, that in this project, communication and good PR is really extremely important because if you are if you are killing some species to save another species, you will have some animal rights uh, issues as well as some ethical issues that need to be addressed. So this has to be done very openly, and the, the communication has to be good. Next. Then we want to, of course, see that all the money that we are investing is, is also producing some biodiversity. So we have research and follow up on the efficiency of these actions. We are uh, assessing the biodiversity value of the man-made wetlands. And we are also looking at the efficiency and effect of the predator control and the removals. Um, we need to know that the action that we are doing is also making the, the effect that we want. And for this, we use some bird counts sampling from directive species like frogs and um, dragonflies. We collect statistics of working hours and, and hunting bags. We also do some wildlife camera research and GPS uh, tracking of, of raccoon dogs to find out how these species react to these measures that we are, we are doing. You can see here, here on the map, there's this, um, all the wetlands that we are looking at at the moment. So we have we are collecting quite a lot of data, but this is also it's very important that we we know and we can also then show that these rest restoration actions also deliver then the, the biodiversity effect that we want to have. And if we see that something doesn't work, so we can then change and do something else instead. So next. I want to thank you all for your attention and if you have any questions. I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heidi. I have to say, perfect timing. Um, OK, that gives us uh, a first view, in this case, uh, with, uh, with uh, an insight from someone working from the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in Finland. Uh, our second speaker is Anna-Gret Larsen, 
and she is an assistant professor in the soil, soil geography and landscape group at Wageningen University, uh, which is uh, in the Netherlands. Dr. Larsen's research focuses on human landscape interaction, abiotic and biotic environmental feedbacks, rewilding, ecosystem services, and her research we can say has implications for conservation, for land use planning, for nature-based solutions. Now in her research, she pays particular attention to a better understanding of the processes within sustainably managed and resilient landscapes and how to create and manage them. I would say an expertise, which adds absolutely at the center of the nature restoration now. Uh, Annegret, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I think I need to share my screen one moment. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah thank, thank you. Yeah, you can see it, uh, it's good. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, my name is Annegret Larsen, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at Wageningen University, as you already said. And but I'm here um, in my function as a member of the Biodiversity Policy Task Force of the European Geoscience Union. So, the European Geosciences Union, in case you don't know, is the leading organization for Earth, planetary, and space science in Europe. It is a, lar a large number of scientists within the EGU are concerned with restoration, actually. And the times at which geoscience is only looking at physical processes is long gone, if it ever at all existed. And many scientists in the EGU are concerned with researching feedbacks between physical processes and life. The EGU Biodiversity Policy Task Force hence welcomes and supports Europe's ambitious nature restoration strategy, and we opt for making it completely binding. We, the EGU Biodiversity Policy Task Force, aims at facilitating the knowledge transfer from research into practice and to connect policymakers with the most relevant geoscience experts. We are confident that the new restoration law is one building stone to construct a resilient future for us and for the generations to come. As geoscientists, we are used to think in longer timescales. For us, it is clear that climate change and human impact have been and are at present the main driver of habitat transformation and biodiversity loss. It is also clear that biodiverse ecosystems are more resilient to change and that current restoration, restoration approaches have been not working to the extent that we need them to work. Otherwise, biodiversity would not continue to decline. As already said, we hence support the ambitious aims of the European restoration law and would like to see it entirely binding. But we are also scientists and we call for a science-based, rigorous and above all a smart restoration which takes local conditions, which I will con call context in this talk, and people into account. I am not here to cover the entire complexity of restoration projects, and I also don't think that is possible. But I want to mention the following three aspects which we want future smart restoration projects to consider. First, we want restoration projects to focus on the recreation of ecosystem functions which were lost in the past. Second, we want to aim at establishing win-win situations for biodiversity, climate protection, climate mitigation, and people. And third, we would like to see back, nature back in the daily life of people, which includes, but is not limited to, for example, cities, but also agriculture, but would also allow the migration and presence of wild animals in, in the frame of rewilding, for example. In the following, I would like to give three examples covering those three points. The first is the reintroduction or rewilding, if you want to, of the ecosystem engineer beaver. Why ecosystem engineers or beavers engineer their environment by damming small rivers and creating ponds. By doing this, they change the ecosystem functioning, which you can even visually detect when you compare those two photos from the same stream with on the right and without the beaver on the left. It is actually the same stream. 
Through damming, beaver stream retain more water for a longer period of time. These are several effects, which are in general very useful to nature and also to us. For example, beaver streams cause increased infiltration. It purifies water, in technical terms, uh, denitrification. It changes the carbon balance of the streams, for example, which leads to an increase of carbon. Of carbon transport in the water which is needed for uh, the aquatic life at the bottom of the food chain downstream of the beaver ponds. Beaver streams are also refugia for wild animals during droughts, which we have seen now in the very recent past, and beaver ponds retain water during flood events. Overall, beaver streams explode with life. They have an incredible effect on biodiversity, and I uh, really would encourage you to, to go and look at one. In summary, the rewilding of beavers create a win-win situation. It increases biodiversity, it is beneficial for climate change mitigation and climate protection, and delivers important ecosystem services to us humans. Beaver ecosystems are also highly resilient to change. However, beaver rewilding has the described effects only in smaller rivers, and it is highly dependent on the context, which means it is a tool of many that we should apply to create smart, win-win restorations. The same principle of smart restoration should be applied to soils. Healthy soils are extremely important for us for food production, as already mentioned. Biodiverse soils are, in a nutshell, storing more carbon and increased fertility. However, a change in soil management is needed to increase biodiversity in soils. There will not be the same measure feasible for every field, unfortunately, and being smart about soil biodiversity means to experiment and to work together interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary which, I, I, um, which is the reason why I put in this graph here. Ecosystems, unfortunately, don't know about disciplinary boundaries, so that's the reason for that. Plus, especially important, we need to involve the most important stakeholder, the farmer, into those restoration projects. To achieve the ambitious restoration goals, we believe that we need to bring nature back into our lives, the daily lives, to create biodiverse ecosystems outside of conservation areas. For example, soil biodiversity can be restored in everybody's backyard if we manage to involve people into restoration projects, like here at Wacheninge, uh, where we basically rewild earthworms into people's gardens. So thank you for your attention and please don't hesitate to get in contact with the biodiversity policy group of the European Geoscience Unions, Geoscience Union, if you have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Anna Gret. Um, our next speaker is a very highly valued colleague here in Brussels. It's Ariel Brunner and he's de deputy director of BirdLife and he coordinates the work on a wide range of EU policies. And that's ranging uh, from nature up to biodiversity conservation, to climate, to energy, fisheries, and agriculture. Uh, over the last decade, he has been deeply involved in the debates on the reform of the common agriculture policy. And I had the pleasure to join, to join some of them. But Ariel, it will, it will be a pleasure to hear you speaking on this topic. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to share my uh, screen as well. Um, I have a bit of an issue. Hmm. Something is not going right here. Uh, let me let me try again. For the moment, we only see the overview of the participants. Yeah. I am not getting the. PowerPoint presentation on the on the screen where I have the options. Um, 
Um, I will check with the, the secretariat at, uh, at FAS if they are able to sort. Have you opened no, this is the shelf screen. Yeah, and yeah. your presentation is open. Okay. So, shall we have to be here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll skip the presentation. Technology has not been friendly to us. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll, do, we'll do without it. No, in, cal in case, Ariel, you can uh, send it to me. And then no, no, let's, I mean, it will be made available to people uh, later on. I think, uh, you know, people don't want to uh, wait to see, uh, to see IT uh, happening. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to make the point. Um, so the starting point is really that uh, we are facing a, an existential crisis around uh, climate change, collapse of biodiversity, and the collapse of ecosystems. Um, I'm sitting at the moment in a country where uh, this summer we've had the worst drought in 500 years um, with terrible impacts on agricultural production, food production, but also on energy production, on navigation, on a number of issues. Last year, in the same time, we had some of the worst floods in, in, in history, and you've all seen the images of the cars being piled up to the top of the, um, of the houses. But uh, those floods also carried away a lot of farmers, so a lot of farms and, and, and livestock and farm machinery, and again, hammered food production. So I would want, first of all, to um, answer to some of the concerns that have already been raised about the fact that we need to maximize agricultural land and we cannot do nature conservation or nature restoration if it means uh, taking some land out of production or changing the type of production. I'm afraid that this takes us uh, straight into a major crisis uh, of survival, including of food security. Um, if we do not rewet peatlands in the uplands and give space to the rivers, we are simply going to flip-flop between situations where crops fail because they go underwater and situations where crops fail because uh, they don't have uh, enough water. Um, Stefan mentioned already the pollinators and so on and so forth. So I really think that we need to get out of this idea of uh, nature as something that is antagonistic to human production and human well-being and start understanding that it is the basis for it. That's not to say that there are no local trade-offs, but this law is giving us exactly the framework for dealing with those uh, frameworks. Overall, we think that the um, commission proposal, while not perfect, is a very good starting point for the debate uh, because it is legally binding, because it is Europe-wide, because it's comprehensive, because it looks at all the right things ranging from the restoration of uh, real high quality biodiversity natural habitats all the way to adding trees in the cities so that we don't cook uh, during uh, heat waves. Um, so I think a lot of what um, uh, the professor that preceded me um, was talking about is in the restoration law. The other thing that we like in this restoration law, and we have seen people raising uh, uh, the usual questions about subsidiarity, about uh, you know, what should the EU be doing. This law is very good because it is uh, setting clear objectives and metrics and timelines and process, but it is leaving the member states completely free to decide how to do it, where to restore, what to restore, how to restore, how to play the incentives. Um, all of those things are being left to the member states, but within a process that is defined by the legislation and hopefully is then under um, uh, commission control in order to ensure that um, uh, all member states pull their weight. And I think some of the MEPs have raised the issue of, of fairness and ensuring that we act everywhere around Europe. So what do we need to still improve? Well, we think that uh, we need to tighten the screws on quite a few things. One is on the overall um, target, 20% of land under restoration is good, but it makes sense if we really narrow it down to area-based uh, 
uh, activities where you actually uh, you know, can measure the hectares and be clear that there is a before and an after, and those hectares will go to become favorable conservation status habitats eventually. Um, we have seen in other policies the risk of having a target which then member states can fill in all sorts of creative ways, and then you get a, a race to the bottom where everybody tries to redefine business as usual as a starvation. This should not happen again. Um, marine conservation, we really need to fix the harmonization between the restoration agenda and the restoration law and the common fisheries policy. Otherwise, marine conservation will be paralyzed by mechanisms like Article 11. We don't have the time to get into the details, but we need to make sure that restoration at sea can actually happen. Um, we have lost in the Commission proposal the 10% uh, landscape um, uh, target, landscape elements target, which is in the EU biodiversity strategy, still in there a bit between the lines, but it needs to be very explicit. It is vital for a lot of the common biodiversity, for game species that people like FACE care about, and for things like pollinators and, and pest control, which agriculture depends on. Um, the peatland target needs to be expanded to forests, not just agriculture. The floods and the droughts in Belgium come quite often from drained peatlands that have been drained for spruce plantations, which are all going to die anyway because of climate change. Rewetting those wetlands is really important, and we need to make sure that when we talk about peatland restoration, we actually talk about things that really restore peatlands, both in terms of the biodiversity and in terms of carbon, and indeed in terms of uh, water retention. And then there is uh, further work to be done on improving uh, the description and the structure of the governance of those um, uh, restoration plans, in particular to ensure that they are science-based, as has already been uh, pointed out before, but also that they are transparent, accountable, that they bring in all stakeholders, that we don't find it ourselves in a situation where the government of the day only discuss with a few people and other people all of a sudden see a map emerging where their house is being restored, which can sound very uh, frightening. In most cases, it's actually a wonderful thing and it increases the value of your house, but you need to know what it is about. You need to feel that you are part of it. And finally, there is the issue of funding. Um, it is up to the member states to figure out how to fund restoration. Member states can decide what they do on state-owned land, what they do on private land, on private land, what sort of incentives they want to give. In some cases, they might want to buy land. In other cases, it's much better to work with the owners. Um, and there is a lot of experience about it, but there is a very strong case for uh, EU funding. Uh, yes, we already have a committed to spend 10% of the budget for biodiversity. We also see that a lot of it is not actually being spent or not being spent effectively. There is an opportunity for the parliament and the member states to um, create here a, a, a serious uh, co-funding uh, obligation, both at EU level and at national level, in order to make sure that we don't end up in the situation where it's the region that needs to do the job, but the EU and the government are not putting the money or that kind of situation of misalignment between the job to be done and the responsibility for, for funding it. A lot more to say, but I'm looking forward for the debate. Thank you very much. And we are certainly looking forward to work with everybody uh, in this virtual room constructively to get a law that is as strong, as effective as possible, and that can still that can start making uh, an impact within the next very few years because the clock is ticking and the ecological collapse is not waiting for any of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ariel. Um, now, um, when Stefan uh, explained a little bit uh, the nature restoration now he already gave an indication that we will not able to implement this without the active support of people in the field he was referring to farmers and landowners it's a pleasure to have a landowner among us and that is uh, max von elverfeld he is the, the president of the german landowners organization the familienbetriebe land und forst uh, he's a, a landowner himself, uh, owning farmland and forest uh, in Germany. 
And Max, it's a pleasure to have you here and to hear your voice on the Nature Restoration Law. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Dear Mr. Amaro, dear members of the European Parliament, dear guests, thank you very much for hosting and joining today's intergroup meeting. A common approach of the EU Commission and the agriculture and forestry sector is key for the success of the nature restoration law. So I'm talking to you as the Vice President of European Land Owners Organization and you said it already, President of the German Land Owners Organization called for me in Betriebe Land and Forst. I want to contribute to our discussions today, the view of farmers and forest managers. To get straight to the, straight to the point, Landowners, farmers, and forest owners support, of course, the idea of an EU Green Deal and its objective to combat climate change and to preserve biodiversity. But yet we are concerned about the chosen means. The concrete obligations within the nature restoration law will lead to restrict production of food and renewable raw materials like wood. In our view, this could be a fundamental mistake because production restrictions not only jeopardize European security of supply in a time of serious market disruptions and unpredictable global supply chains, they also, they also inevitably lead to relocations of production to non-European third countries, and thus to carbon leakage and to the export of environmental problems. In addition, restrictions in the production of renewable raw materials, materials like wood lead to substitution by other materials such as steel or concrete, the production of which causes much more intensive environmental interventions. In detail, the Ukraine war and the fragility of international supply chains require Europe to maintain production capacities to secure the supply of food and renewable raw materials. This also means that Europe must live up to its responsibility to support other countries with greater food dependency, for example, the Middle East or Africa, to the best of its ability. A logical, a logical consequence of reducing production would be a shift to other countries, leaking environmental problems outside Europe. No one could want this. Insofar, habitat protection, protection must be integrated into production so as not to cause a shift of production to non-European third countries through production restrictions and provoke an overland of environmental resources there. Europe must export stability and security, not externalize environmental problems. According to the calculations by German state-funded Thun Institute, for example, implementing the goals set out in the EU biodiversity strategy, with which the nature restoration law also aims to achieve, which re would reduce German timber production up to 48%. This would create a considerable shortage of raw materials, which can only be compensated for by imports or by climate damaging substitutes. Finally, a more precise ecological impact assessment is needed. It is scientifically proven that managed forests store more carbon than set aside forests. And the climate friendliness of managed forests must be included in the discussion on habitat protection. If managed forests are better for the climate, human habitat management should also be given preference over wilderness. Another example of counteracting to the aim of improving biodiversity is the suggestion of increasing the share of deadwood in forests, such creating structures in which forest fires are further facilitated. We just had this in a lot of countries in Europe. If the nature restoration law shall be success, it must avoid restrictions in production. It must be based on a proper impact assessment. And one more thing, it must involve the stakeholders by setting incentives. We talked about this already. Expecting the principle of subsidiarity, we welcome the draft of the nature restoration law, opens a, vari a variety of options to the member states of how to reach objectives. However, the EU Commission should make clear to the member states that the key to success is not regulatory law, 
but mechanism of incentives to win the landowner support. We call on the European Commission to focus on European climate and biodiversity protection towards cooperation with land users to better balance the flexibility of supply with climate and biodiversity protection and to establish production integrated environmental protection mechanism. Thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Max. Uh, and indeed, uh, as you were our last expert speaker on the topic, uh, we can go no now into the panel debate. Uh, we have quite a number of questions uh, coming in. Coming in. Uh, if the audience has still uh, additional questions, please put them in the question and answer uh, section uh, of which you find uh, uh, below this, uh, at the lower level of your screen. Um, I will first give the, the floor to members of the European Parliament who would uh, like to, to ask uh, a question. If that would be the case and you're, let's say, live on my screen, you can put up your hand. Uh, if you're within the audience, you can make use also of the question and answers uh, part. If I don't, I don't see immediately someone uh, popping up, but please, please uh, show your hand uh, if you would like to, to, to interfere. I will be happy to give you the floor. Um, before I go into some of the questions we have seen in, uh, in uh, the question and answer section, I have a first question myself, and I will, I will ask with uh, Stefan uh, uh, with the question that I have. Uh, we are now practicing nature conservation for, I would say, the last 50 to 100 years, but let's say even the oldest nature reserves are older than 100 years, if you go back to, to the United States. Now we have systematically put forward uh, biodiversity targets, which we did not reach. The result of that is that we put new targets, uh, which we then consequently did not reach. And so that is repeating itself. Now we have this nature restoration now. Is this an indication that we have not been able to set up or at least not been able to implement a decent nature conservation policy? Thank you for a very pertinent question. First of all, you're right. We had in Europe in many previous biodiversity strategies targets on restoration. In this biodiversity strategy to 2020, there was the target to restore 15% of degraded ecosystems. And we did a lot of work in developing guidance documents on how member states should develop a national restoration uh, plan, etc. Very little happened. I think Finland is one of the, and the Netherlands are some of the few exceptions where actually they developed such a, an integrated uh, planning. And that demonstrates the added value of legally binding uh, laws like the regulation, because unfortunately, just with these voluntary elements in a strategy, not enough action is happening. This is our experience. Now, let's not uh, say that nothing happened. I think uh, both within protected areas, in particular within protected areas, a lot of restoration has indeed been happening. And there is a lot of life projects. There are a lot of examples where restoration has been happening. And I think the two presentations we had from, from Finland, the Helmi uh, project is an excellent example where indeed when uh, several administrations work well together, where several stakeholders work well together on the ground, you can have effective restoration happening with the uh, cooperation also of the local people and with added benefits for the local people. The problem is that all those restoration efforts have been outweighed by increased destruction outside those protected areas because we had then an intensification of uh, farming, we had a homogenization of uh, forest land, so we had a rush into biofuels. There was a whole lot of things happening uh, outside those protected areas. And this is why our proposal is now not about protection, but it's about restoration that can still happen in, in protected areas. But the idea is to have a much broader landscape approach to have restoration happening in a wider scale 
than was happening before, so as to make sure that also, for example, in more intensively managed agricultural areas, you have more landscape features, you have an increase of pollinator indicators, you have an increase of farmland bird indicators, and it is possible. We have examples where some member states have engaged in this using CAP uh, to do that. So I think this is really the, this transformative change that we need to have to go beyond protected areas, still increase protected areas and make sure that they fulfill their role and restoration is happening there, but go on a much more wider scale. Okay, that is clear. And I have to say, I have a, a similar question for uh, Ariel because there are two, uh, I would say, uh, we have in uh, the last 50 years, we have seen a number of nature conservation organizations becoming very big, but we are not reaching the biodiversity goals. Does that mean that uh, those nature conservation organizations are not reaching their goals neither? Yes, um, I have no problem admitting that we have not finished our job. Um, uh, I could argue that maybe we are not big enough and all of you should join us. Uh, but uh, jo jo jokes apart, um, you know, we've launched today uh, a report on um, uh, wildlife comeback that has looked at the success stories of mammals and birds that um, have come back. Um, and it's very clear why they have come back. They have come back because of legal protection, the Birds and Habitats Directives, the Natura 2000 Network, investment in active restoration, life projects, and so on and so forth. So we have shown that we, when we tackle problems, the loss of biodiversity is not something that comes from above and there's nothing that can be done about it. The reality is that while some uh, species uh, you know, have been coming back, a lot more species have been collapsing for the reason that uh, Stefan uh, explained before, essentially because of the inherent mismanagement of land. If you look at the way we have been doing agriculture and forestry and fishing and land planning and a number of other things over the last 50 years, you know, we've achieved in Europe very good levels of well-being, but we have been systematically destroying the ecology and now it's coming back to uh, haunt us. I must say that I was very disappointed by um, uh, what we've just heard from um, uh, the ELO, apart from some, I think, factually problematic things about, for example, the, uh, you know, the role of um, uh, dead wood and old growth forest and so on. Uh, I'm not sure we have the time to, to go into it, um, but I would really welcome a more open-minded uh, approach. The idea that nature restoration means less production and hence exporting impacts. It's just a wrong way of looking at it. Look at this year, you know, lowest uh, maize production in France in a generation because of the drought and the lack of water and the lack of resilience, that's food security. So we can combine uh, nature restoration with productive systems, it is not true that it's about not cutting trees. It's about things like gradually replacing monoculture uh, forest plantations, which are the biggest fire hazard that we have and that are going to die because of climate change and insects and so on with broadly forests, including some set aside areas, which would allow us to, among other things, keep producing uh, wood into the future. It is about bringing back both linear landscape elements and grasslands into the farmed environment, which will mean that we will be able to produce food into the future with less pesticides, with less vulnerability to, uh, to climate uh, disruptions. So if you care about wood production and food production and fish production, you should really care about nature restoration. And we have the examples to, uh, uh, to show it. I'll just finish with one example from the marine environment because we've, until now, people mentioned uh, the land. Well, one of the examples that we are excited about is actually from outside the EU. It's a bay in Turkey where the establishment of a protected area in cooperation with the local fishermen, including the creation of integral no-take zone has resulted within very few years 
in, apart from the return of all sorts of rare species and sharks and so on, but the income of the local fishermen has increased four times because now there are big fish that can reproduce and produce small fish that can actually be fished. So let's get out of this logic that every hectare of nature restoration is a, le a hectare less of production. It's not true and it is taking us down a situation where most of our land will stop producing. Thanks. Max, Ariel is disappointed. Um, are you avoiding to work on, on, on nature restoration? Or is there a link you see between, between production and nature restoration and a balance between the two? When I listen to Mr. Brunner, thank you very much. It sounds quite optimistic and it would be perfect. It would be like this, but we see when you see from the past, when you see the nature 2000, we see the restriction areas we have in Germany, there is quietly less production when I look to the areas. And we talk about um, 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 a pesticide reduction. We talk about less production finally. So I'm not sure if we really can um, 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 integrate it, but would be glad if it will be so. Okay, now I have a question for, for Annegret. Um, this law is called the nature restoration law. Uh, and it's especially the word restoration in it. Eh? If, I, if I'm speaking about the restoration of a house, I'm restoring it into its original, uh, the, the original way it was built. If we are speaking about the restoration of, of, of nature, there too we are referring to a situation in the past. That can be 10, 20, 50, 100 years. Now we have in the last uh, decades uh, climate change. Uh, so the question I have for you is, is restoring the right way forward? Uh, are we able to rebuild the habitats we had, uh, we had in the past? Or do we have to take into account uh, the effect of climate change? Yeah, so thank you very much for that question. That is, of course, a very difficult question, yeah, scientifically. So, of course, it's, it's the question after the baseline, right? To what do we restore uh, ecosystems to? And um, what do we choose as a baseline to restore them? And how do we, yeah, yeah, how do we take climate change into account when we do this? So first of all, what we argue for as being geoscientists and not bioscientists in a way, right, is that we restore physical processes a lot as well when we do restoration projects, which means that we, yeah, that we restore the basis of ecosystems to recover from stress and to be more resilient to future climate change which is why I chose the example of the beaver, because the beaver actually is able to restore ecosystems to what has been there previously in the past. So before humans eradicated the beavers, the streams would have very likely looked very similar to what we find at present in beaver streams, yeah? Because the beaver restores the physical processes and that then, yeah, like widens into biodiversity and, and, and yeah, facilitates life. So, but that also brings me to a second point that I really wanted to make. So thank you for raising that. If we now want to restore biodiversity, right? That's, that's what this law is for. We have to also make sure that we have a baseline, yeah, that we measure against scientifically. So we need to make sure that we understand what is there at the moment in order to compare it to what is going to be there after our restoration efforts to control for the improvements that we have scientifically. So even though that does not answer your, your, your question um, directly, that is also a point that I think needs to be made here very much. Yeah, I hope okay, I answered a few yeah, things. Thanks. Thank you. I, I, I'm certainly aware that the question I was asking is a difficult one. Let's say the easy questions I'm answering myself and for the difficult ones I'm asking someone else. 
Um, I would like to give the floor to um, wait uh, there uh, to to one of our members of the European Parliament, uh, Maria uh, Narco, uh, who has a question. Maria, the floor is yours. Um, ich habe keine Frage, sondern ich habe eine, eine Feststellung nochmal, denn in der Diskussion und in den Wortmeldungen vorher kam mehrfach auf, wenn wir mehr Biodiversität schaffen, werden wir Flächen für die Landwirtschaft verlieren und dann kommt es zu einer Schwächung der Ernährungssouveränität oder der Ernährungssicherheit. Und ich müsste genau in die gegenteilige Richtung argumentieren, wenn wir es nicht schaffen, die Natur wiederherzustellen, dann kommt es auf jeden Fall langfristig zu einer Schwächung der Möglichkeit, Menschen satt zu machen. Nur eine gesunde Natur kann Menschen dauerhaft satt machen. Und ich spreche wirklich von dauerhaft satt machen. Ähm, ich muss ganz ehrlich sagen, dass mir das missfällt, so zu tun wie, wir haben die Entscheidung, werden wir satt von einer Fläche oder gibt es, gibt es äh, Umweltbereiche? Wer so argumentiert, würde ja schlicht diese beiden Punkte aufeinanderhetzen, als wären sie konträr. Nur ein wirklich gesunder Boden, gesundes Bodenleben, eine gute Humusschicht, nur gute, gesunde Bestäuber, nur die Möglichkeit mit gu gutem Wasserkörper, es sichern uns auf Dauer die Ernährung. Deswegen glaube ich, ist es genau, äh, genau so zu verstehen, wir haben die Verpflichtung, und ich habe es in meinem Eingangsstatement deutlich gemacht, es gibt nur noch ein kleines Zeitfenster dazu. Wir haben die Verpflichtung, jetzt etwas zu tun. Wir dürfen das nicht auf dem Rücken anderer machen. Wir dürfen nicht sagen, die Landeigentümer sind jetzt die Dummen. Um das geht es nicht. Wir müssen sie ins Boot holen. Und wenn ich merke, dass in Deutschland zum Beispiel Gelder ausgegeben werden, weil zum Beispiel die Bereiche, weil Kohle nicht mehr gefördert wird, gibt es dort Umstellungsgelder, weil Kohle nicht mehr gefördert wird. So brauchen wir auch Umstellungsgelder für eine, für eine neue Art der Agrar der Agrarstrukturen und dafür brauchen wir die Landwirte und die Eigentümer unbedingt an unserer Seite, was aber nicht mehr aufgemacht werden darf, ein Gegensatz. Und nochmal, satt werden unsere Kinder und Enkelkinder nur, wenn wir die Biodiversität wiederherstellen. Um, I think, uh, Max, I'm, I'm coming, back, uh, coming back to you after, after hearing these comments. Um, let's say in the period that I've been working for the European Landowners Organization, uh, let's say, I've always heard, okay, there is a major difference between a landowner farmer and a farmer as such. A landowner farmer who sees the land as, as capital because you want to give it in at least the same quality to the next generation. Like quite often a farmer not being a landowner is using it as a commodity. Um, on your land, uh, what, what are you doing to, to make sure that let's say you give the land to the next generation in at least the same quality you got it. You mean me, of course, eh, Jürgen? Yeah. yeah that, that is indeed for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As our representative left <laughs> over. Of course, the farmland we allow to produce or we produce it whatever. 10 generations or something. So of course we always to to um, our main target is to bring the land in the best situation to the next generation and we try to do so. You always make mistakes of course, but we always try to um, um, manage with the land the best we can of course. But I just want to um, make a little remark to what um, Maria Neuchel said. Um, the experience we have in Germany is a little bit different from that what we're talking about. When I see, when I look to the protected areas we already have in Germany, there is a lot of obligations in the productions, even in the forest or in the agriculture. And until now, there is, of course, then less production. I'm very sorry about that, but it's like this. So we really have to talk about it. And we have to see what kind of targets we have and how we can come to the targets. We tried on our farmland in our wood to integrate everything, but we still look on the production we, we can, because we'll have to live and we have to, to, to feed our population and everything. So we really have to be careful with it. And it's not so easy as we talk about it today. I, again, I see it in the protected areas, look to the protected areas, we have strict protected areas and there is less possibilities to manage. And we really have to look about that, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, Anna Gret, you were asking uh, the floor. Yes, I, oh, I know my hand. Sorry. Uh, thank you. 
um, for that comment, uh, my my question is a different one. So if you're if you're driving through Germany at the moment, yeah, so you drive up the uh, the Sauerland Highway. I don't remember the exact number of it. The A40, I think that is. There is so much dead forest. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And it has died from the, I guess, from a lot of stress factors together. So I would argue that it is not really restoration that's going to decrease uh, any yield we have from that forest, right? What actually destroys the yield is uh, climate change in combination with a mismanagement, right? Because these are all conifers that dies, die. You can see that visually with your eyes. So I think that is uh, one of these examples that we search for when yeah, we don't have to search for them. They're actually there, I think. Uh, Max, you were asking the floor. I suppose you have an answer to this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good discussion. I like it. Perfect. Very good. But I think forest management is different from farming management because when you plant when you plant a tree, it takes like whatever 60 to 100 years until it's a big tree. So when we talk about the problems we have in our forest today, you talked about the, the destroyed woods we have. It's all things our grandparents did. So they had to plant these conifers after the war because it needed to do it. So you can't tell it like a mismanage. We learned today to plant it different. Now we will do it different. But it's very complicated because the thing of generations. And of course, we know that we have to plant different trees in the forest to bring them um, um, strong enough for the climate change we have. But again, this has nothing to do with restriction, you know, we make or protection we make. I think that's different. We have a lot of protected woods, which are destroyed too, you know, so we have to be careful about everything. But of course, we have to change the management in these forests, of course. Okay, thank you, Max. Uh, Ariel? Yeah, I, I want just to uh, build further on that, although I, I realize we are running out of time. You know, when we are talking about forest restoration in many contexts, it's not about logging less, it's about not replanting or not replanting the same things and so on. Um, when we are talking about the older, better forests that we have, it is in some cases about uh, logging less. Um, but we know that if we do not have some forests that are allowed to be mature, and I'm afraid to accumulate dead wood, which is not a fire risk, the big trees are not a fire risk, it's the small ones that are, um, we are not going to have the healthy forests and we are not going to have uh, the protection from the floods, from climate change and so on, which are the things that are going to kill us and kill also our wood production and our food production. When it comes to food, I will not open now the issue of the consumption side. You know how we are using uh, food, you know, as long as we are paying people to burn 150 million loaf of bread every year um, and some of the people in this debate are voting in favor of it I think we should you know have a bit of also the intellectual honesty to say you know is the solution for food security in cultivating every last square meter of land until the, it all collapses and we cultivate anything or is the solution to start reducing our waste of food, our waste of food through bioenergy, our waste of food through the livestock system, on the one hand, and on the other hand, produce better in a more ecologically benign way. And this does include also in certain specific areas, giving some land back to nature. Because the reality is that, for example, floodplain restoration, yes, you might need to uh, produce a little bit less uh, maize and, uh, and poplars, but you will avoid having total crop failure over a much bigger area. Look at your know, country that I know quite well is Italy. Italy, Italian farming has been hammered by the drought this summer, whole regions that have produced hardly anything. And now whole farms and, and whole crops that have not been killed by the, uh, by the drought, are being killed by the flood. Now, 
a little bit of giving back land to the rivers, a little bit of better uh, uh, protection forests in the in the uplands, a bit more grasslands in the hill instead of arable would go a long way into actually increasing the food production this year. So really, this is a false dichotomy. It might be true at a farm level. Yes, if you look at the hectare, you cannot have a pit bog and a dairy pasture at the same time. You cannot have an eucalyptus plantation and a native Mediterranean forest on the same hectare. Hectare by hectare, yes, and that's why we need to be smart about it. We need to look at the trade-offs. We need to bring in fair compensations, everything you want. But when you look at a slightly bigger level, even at the landscape level, let alone at regional and national level and at European level, it is just not true. The biggest risk to food production and to wood production is systemic ecologic failure leading to total loss. It is not shaving a percentage here or there to a different land use. Thank you. Systematic ecologic failure. Um, you mentioned a number of things you are linking from one side to the other. I'm going to Heidi because I know that, that let's say hunting and, and nature conservation is, a, is another element which quite often is not seen as being compatible. Uh, how, how, how do you see that? Well, um, we have actually come to the conclusion, and it's not not just um, as hunters. We have a, a strong support from the from the um, uh, researching research community and also of the bird watchers community that we have to um, for what in regard to the effect of the invasive alien species in Finland, which are destroying the breeding piece for the for the waterfowl so this is this is a uh, discussion that we don't have to have anymore it's it's clear and we are we we are doing this and someone asked me if we do it uh, during the breeding season if we have to do it during the breeding season then we have uh, been unsuccessful in the because if you want to be if you want to produce um uh, good breeding season you have to be there before the birds are breeding so if there's no need to go in there during the breeding season of the predators because you have to have done the, the culling already earlier. And then there was this um, one question about that, do we are we hunting then those waterfowl that we are now creating these environments for? So yes, yes, of course, those game species we are and we are now because the problem is in the in the production of the young, we are not producing offspring and, and hunting basis uh, on the uh, we, we, we hunt only the offspring of those birds and we have to produce enough birds so that we are able to hunt sustainably and that is one of the biggest problems now that we are at the moment we are not producing enough offspring so that's why we need to um, create these uh, environments and uh, that, that the birds can breed breed successfully in but of course these same wetlands that we are creating they are also producing birds that are not hunted a lot of wetland birds and and many, many of uh, many waterfowl are not hunted. It's just a small proportion that is hunted. Those that are the most numerous ones, and they are hunted uh, sustainably. And then there was this one question I'm asking about these artificial environments that I would like to address here. That um, when we create in Finland wetlands, uh, we are not, um, we are not. It's it's like we are in, we are trying to in this project we are mim mimicking the beaver ponds like we were here earlier heard how effective the beavers are but we we mimic the beavers in in the way we build the dams and the, and the, and the wetlands and uh, fin one must remember we in Finland the, we have been the model land for uh, drying out our because we, we have plenty of water we have water everywhere and we have tried to drain everything. All the forests and all the agriculture that we have been trying trying to get the water out but now we are seeing with climate change that we also start to we need to start thinking differently and wetlands are also one solution there and if we are creating wetlands i would say that they are i wouldn't call them artificial environments because uh, th there have been wetlands we are creating wetlands where there used to be wetlands so they are they are not artificial in that sense. 
Um, Heidi, while you are talking, uh, several of the questions uh, we're also referring to, uh, we have the national plans for the common agriculture policy, uh, which still have to be implemented. Is, is, is this, well, let's say, which were proposed before the nature restoration law, um, is that the wrong procedure? Should we have done it in the, in the opposite way? You have both uh, feet in the ground, what, what is your feeling about that? You need to repeat the question. I didn't, do you, what, can yeah. you please? So, so let's say we, let's say most of the countries have given their uh, common agriculture policy strategic plans to the commission before we had the nature restoration now. Would, have, would, have, would, have, would it have been more interesting to do it in the opposite way? that we first had, let's say, a good view on the nature restoration law, and then discussing how agriculture can contribute. A very good question. A very good question, because we have in, well, I would, we will have another CAP strategic plan coming up. We will start working on that one. And now when we have, if we have the biodiversity or the restoration law, then we can consider it because we are doing this at the same time. And we, as we, were, we heard here earlier about the peatlands and you, I don't know how many of you know, but in Finland, peatlands are absolutely, we have a lot of, Finland is basically a big peatland. We have peatland everywhere. And a lot of our agricultural land is peatland. So we, that's a big question and that needs to be answered. And revetting uh, part of the more inventing some kind of agricultural strategies where you can have the peatlands wet and and farm them is is one one solution. But it's interesting. I don't know which one. Some one of them had to come first, and I hope that now when we continue, then we will have to take into consideration the other one. Stefan, I saw that you are eager to give an answer to this one. Yes, um, of course. Ideally, we would have had the naturist law approved and adopted and entering into force before we had started with the process of developing the uh, the uh, cap strategic plans but let's not forget that the biodiversity strategy was out there and it was supported by the member states the council and the parliament and nothing that is in the nature restoration law was not already uh, in the biodiversity strategy. The biodiversity strategy talked about restoring nature, putting Europe's uh, nature on the path to recovery. It talked about having more landscape features. It talked about having more free flowing rivers. It talked about reversing the decline of pollinators. It talked about changing the way we manage our forests to be more resilient, more biodiverse, more deadwood. It talked about everything we have in the nature restoration law. It just concretizes this and makes it more clear on how and what the member states need to do by when. But, and, and the biodiversity strategy was known. So I think there is no excuse for member states for not trying to use this important instrument to really uh, support what needs to be done uh, on the land. And let's not forget that the CAP strategic plan can be changed any moment if the member states want so. So once the nature restoration law enters into force and the member state realizes that the, the instruments that are available are not sufficient. It is possible to adapt the CAP strategic plan uh, and in order to be more effective in contributing towards implementing the nature restoration. I must say, I really welcome this discussion. I think that, for example, what uh, Maria Neuchel said, I, I wanted to find the thing where you can show your clapping hands <laughs> because that's exactly the philosophy that our proposal is about. It's not about more discrepancy between protection and management. It's not about uh, all these things. It's really about finding a way to manage and restore our ecosystems, uh, as Annegret uh, Larsen has to say, so that they can fulfill their functions in a much better way. And the functions are multiple. They are also economic and social, um, but um, that requires um, a much more w better way of managing our land and sea. And, and I think so many speakers have mentioned these co-benefits that are out there. We need to find ways to cooperate on the ground in order that those co-benefits are really being generated. And, 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 and this, this whole idea that more restoration means 
less production is certainly not correct, particularly when you look at the long term. Uh, I think President uh, von der Leyen in her speech on the State of the Union has said very clearly that nature is our biggest ally and we need intergenerational justice. So we also have to make sure that our future generations do not inherit a devastated uh, nature, but inherit a nature that is able to fulfill its various functions. And that's what our law proposal is really about. Okay, I have uh, one last task, I would say for, for each of our speakers, including uh, uh, Maria Nuachu and uh, Stefan, but I will, I will start with, with our experts. Um, if there is one thing, and you have to be able to explain me that within 15 seconds, if there is one thing you would like to change or to add to the nature restoration now, what would that be? Okay, 15 seconds, one ID, be short, Heidi. Well, I would, at the moment when I've been looking at the restoration law, there's not, a, not much about the invasive alien species, especially the effect on predators. And it, I think that is something that is really, we know from the research. I, I would add that one there. Thank you. That was exactly within the 15 seconds as promised. Anna Gret. Sorry, wrong button. So, oh, that's very difficult. Uh, after a talk fast. Now, what I would like to add is to measure biodiversity right now so that we have a baseline against uh, what we improve in the future. And um, yeah, and second, I would like to see more rewilding and bringing nature back into everybody's life. In there. Thank you. Even if that was cheating, that were two ideas, but okay. Ariel? I was about to cheat in the same way, but she burned me, so I have to only choose one. Um, if I really had to choose only one, uh, I would probably fix uh, the problem of the misalignment with um, uh, the common fisheries policy, because half, broadly speaking, of what we need to restore is at sea, and at the moment we risk having a, a restoration law that sounds very good, will do something on land and will do absolutely nothing at sea, and that would be a disaster for all of us, starting with uh, the fishing communities, not to mention all the coastal communities that make a living from you know, a, li a living ocean in different ways. So uh, I, I think that would be my but there's, there's quite a few others. Okay. I promise you that next time we will include include the sea owner. Um, Max, you are the next one. Just to say, I'm really know how important it is to preserve biodiversity. Not, please don't understand, not understand me wrong. And you know my estate, we have the wildlife estate label from the ELO, so our farmland is really, we're looking for biodiversity. But I have two wishes for, two big wishes for the nature restoration law. First is one, cooperation and not regulation, cooperation with the stakeholder. The second is integrated in the protection, uh, in the production and not strict protected. This is my two main wishes. Thank you. Okay. That too was one too much, but okay, thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> Stefan, difficult question for you, uh, but you can speak as a person and, as, and not as an employee of the commission. No, no, this I cannot do <laughs> today. I will tell you privately, no, of course, our law proposal is perfect uh, and there is nothing to be changed. No, what I would say is that what I would really uh, would change is the misperception that we have been hearing from several um, areas about what the law is about. Uh, and I think, I hope I have helped and we helped today to really clarify a lot of those misconceptions. This is not about uh, putting aside all of our land and uh, having no production anymore. This is really about what I said uh, previously. So that would be my, my hope that there is better understanding of what we want to do with this law and there is uh, less of these misperceptions out there. I certainly think you have the support of the different organizations around the table over here. Uh, Maria, what would you still change? Ich würde sagen, Freiwilligkeit war gestern, Verbindlichkeit für die Mitgliedstaaten ist heute. Ich würde sagen, Ausgleichszahlungen für Landwirte war gestern, 
echte Honorierung bis heute. Und ich würde sagen, abwarten war gestern, endlich zupacken bis heute. Okay, thank you very much. And there is one person remaining. He will not only give his view, but he will also conclude this, uh, this discussion. And that is uh, Alvaro Amaro as chair of this intergroup. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a, a very intensive and a good debate. Uh, and it's, 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 it's very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends. Uh, it, it has been a pleasure to discuss the nature restoration uh, law proposal with uh, all of you. It was interesting to hear all the different perspectives. It was what we look for in our intergroup. This is only the beginning of the process. Uh, as everybody said, the restoration proposal just reached the parliament and more work lies ahead for us, European lawmakers. The European parliament has a key role to play as the institution reflecting most of the reality of everyday life of land users throughout this direct link with, this, with citizens. This law is one of the most important pieces of legislation since the adoption of the Habitats Directive in, in 1992. That's why it is essential not to miss the start of this legislation and involve I can repeat, involve from the beginning the countryside community, such as hunters, farmers, land managers, environmental groups, anglers, and other interest stakeholders, like the municipalities in the planning process. From the beginning, the countryside community has been asking for more effective protection, not more strict protection, and the legally binding targets. In fact, we need to keep in mind that restoration will only work if it is supported by the interest stakeholders. If not, it will fail. The challenge is huge but we have some good examples on how it can work and how restoration is working. For example, the Finnish case present today was a very good illustration. We can also hear from scientists and environmental ONGs that restoration requires a landscape level approach. This means that restoration is required on a very big scale. This shows exactly how important is the role of stakeholders, including farmers, land managers, and hunters. It is also normal that there is some nervousness around this field. This is because many member states have not been actively consulting rural stakeholders. And the truth, the truth, is that the rural stakeholders and community groups are key for developing and supporting successful conservation measures. We have also a new reality in Europe, which must be considered in the implementation of these new measures. A terrible war, high inflation, particularly higher energy prices, and also higher prices in other raw materials and production factors. Several climate events increasing in number and intensity. Finally, the right European, national and regional incentives must be provided to promote community-based conservation and increase local acceptance and support by relevant stakeholders to ensure 
that restoration projects become success stories. Since it is in everyone's interest to succeed, funding should be made available in a clear and coherent framework. Be sufficient for the restoration measures expected and be delivered effectively if the work is to be complete in a cost effective and timely manner. Restora restoration is achievable, but only with full education of the different land managers or users of where, what, why, and how restoration will improve their lives. We must talk with them, not to them. Thank you again for joining our webinar. And thank you so much for your approach and your intelligent works and speech in this wonderful webinar. I wish you all a pleasant evening over. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, that would give me the opportunity to thank all of our speakers, uh, the interpreters, the members of the intergroup, our audience, and the secretariat at FACE and ELO uh, for putting all of this uh, together. I am aware that we have not been able to answer all of the questions coming in. I've tried to do my utmost best to, do as, uh, to answer as much uh, as possible. Know that the recording and the PowerPoint presentations which have been shown or which have not been shown will be available on the intergroup website. I wish you all a very pleasant evening and then I wish you all the halting of the loss of biodiversity in the near future. Thank you very much.